Well, today we are continuing this series that we've been in now for the last couple months. It's called Sent Life on Mission. And for those of you who are brand new, I know every week God's bringing more people to join us. And so uh, if you're brand new, this is a series that's based on a study of one of the longer books in the Bible. It's kind of the second part of the Bible we call the New, to, New Testament or Newer Testament. Um, and it's, it's, uh, the book is called the book of Acts. So Acts is written by a man named Luke, who's a, a passionate follower of Jesus. He's a, a very intelligent guy, well-educated, uh, and he's fascinated with the whole movement of Jesus. And so he's done careful historical research. He's put together a two-volume set designed to be read together, kind of like uh, volume one, volume two, more like a season two, season one of a, of a TV drama, kind of assuming, you, you know, that season two assumes you've read season one or watched season one. Uh, and so the, 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 vo- the first volume covers the life of Jesus, uh, his life, death, and resurrection, and we call that the Gospel of Luke. Uh, the second, uh, uh, second uh, volume is, uh, we call it the book of Acts, and it covers the, the birth of the movement of Jesus and covers the first 30 years as it expands from Jerusalem across the Roman Empire all the way to Rome, to the capital, uh, over that 30 years. And so uh, as we unpack this, uh, the last few weeks that we've been together, We've been watching as two of the leaders of this young movement of Jesus, uh, two men, Peter and John, two of the apostles, that they have gone into the temple, which remember, 35-acre complex, uh, five football fields by three football fields. Uh, It is uh, more like a fortress than a church, huge walls around it. They have gone in at three o'clock one day to pray. And so this is what they do every day because Jews at nine and three would come to the temple every day to pray. So hundreds and thousands of people are coming in. But on this particular day, uh, as they're going in, God calls Peter to do something that he hadn't had him do before, which is to pray for this lame man that's there. He's uh, he's in his 40s. He's been lame uh, his whole life, never walked. And uh, very chances are that he'd seen this man many times before because we're told that this man was brought there every day to beg at 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 the temple gates, uh, you know, that he'd be supported by the donations of others. We know that Peter would go to the temple every day to meet with the new believers in this area called Solomon's Colonnade. We'll talk about that later. Uh, And so chances are he'd seen it before, but on this particular day, Peter senses God calling him to heal this man in the name of Jesus. And so if you've been in the last couple of weeks, we talked about this, so they go by in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, uh, rise and walk, and this man who's never walked before in his life the bones, tendons, ligaments, muscles come together instantly. And not only is he healed physically, but he's able to walk, which he's never learned how to do. And so he kind of goes off. They go inside the temple complex. He is running. He is jumping. He is praising the God of Israel who has healed him. This draws a tremendous crowd, as you can imagine, hundreds, thousands of people. And so today we're going to pick up the story right there as Peter is going to have a chance to share about Jesus, their Messiah, who has just healed this man. So if you have your Bibles, you have your apps, let's go ahead and open up to chapter 3 and verse 11. There in your note sheet is a section called Sent the Sermon. And I want to say one thing about this uh, this message, this sermon that Peter is about to give. You may have figured this out, but these sermons in Acts play a huge part of the story Luke is telling. Uh, As an author, it's how he's crafting his, his statement. He wants to tell you what happened in the movement of Jesus, but he also wants to tell you the message of the movement of Jesus. And as an author, the way he does that is through the sermons. So the sermons play a very important part. And so these sermons, what we're reading here are the cliff notes, the the summary, the short version of the message. If you were to read these sermons in Acts, none of them would take more than a couple minutes to read. Obviously, there were much longer messages. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, we're told after the first sermon in Acts on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached, that that Luke actually tells us with many more words that he challenges the the group. So these are their summaries of the most important things. So picture this, like uh, you're talking to a friend in your life group and they're saying, hey, I couldn't be there this week. I haven't listened to the podcast yet. What did Mike talk about? You're not going to sit down and say, well, here's a note sheet. Let's sit down for the next 45 minutes. Let me figure this out, right? (laughs) or next hour, or whatever, uh, you're going to say, you're going to give them the 90-second version, the two-minute version. Here is the main topic. Here's the key points. And that's what, that's what Luke is doing. And with each sermon in Acts, they're building on the other, and they're sharing, this is the message of Jesus. This is the core. And so these sermons are very intentional as Luke uses them as an author to advance the plot line and advance the message. Are you with me on this? 
So these messages are incredibly important. They're not just random, that he is selecting from them the things that he thinks Theophilus and the rest of his leaders, his readers, need to understand, understand who Jesus is, what it means to follow him. And so uh, today as we launch in, we're going to have one of these kind of short synopsis, uh, and it's extremely important what he says. And so here we're going to pick it up in chapter 3 in verse 11. And so he says, while the man held on to Peter and John. So he's just healed this man. He's running around. Everyone's coming to see. He says, all the people were astonished. They come running to the place called Solomon's Colonnade. Now, we know exactly where this was from the writings of Josephus and others. Uh, This 35-acre complex on the eastern side was this huge patio area called Solomon's Colonnade. The way to picture this, we call them like uh, porticos, but we don't really use that language much. If you can kind of picture the Parthenon in Greece, if you've ever seen that, that, um, you know, there's these huge stone columns, right, that go up, and on top there's a stone ceiling. It creates an open-air patio underneath. This could, uh, could house thousands of people. This is where the early church would meet to be instructed by the apostles, uh, to worship, to pray. And so that's where this is taking place. So in verse 12, so when Peter uh, sees this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you, this healing? Uh, why do you look at us as if by our own power or our godliness, our spirituality, that we made them walk as if it's like we're the holy people or something? He said, here's what's going on. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, your God, our God, the God we all worship, uh, the God of our fathers, he's glorified his servant, Jesus. Remember a couple weeks ago when I was teaching on miracles, how miracles in the early church were not just uh, an act of compassion or kindness on those who are suffering. They were that, but remember we said they're signs. They're pointing to Jesus that he's truly who he claims to be and that the apostles are speaking for him and this message leads to life. This is what he's saying. He's saying uh, God, the God of our fathers, is glorifying Jesus by this miracle. He's showing you that Jesus is who he claims to be, so you need to be paying attention. And so he says, uh, the God of our fathers is glorifying uh, his servant Jesus. You you handed him over to be killed. So we got a problem here. Uh, Two to three months earlier, many of the people in this same crowd had been there when Jesus was put on trial in front of the Roman governor Pilate. Luke told us all about this in Luke 22 and 23 in volume one of his story. So he assumes we remember this. Because if you're reading through, that's just a few chapters ago. And if you remember the account, when Jesus was brought before the Roman governor Pilate, Pilate wants to release it. But the people call for his crucifixion. And Pilate even tries to substitute because normally during Passover, he would free one prisoner. He said, listen, who should I give you? Barabbas, who is this uh, famous murderer, or give you Jesus, thinking they're like, well, we'll pick Jesus rather than the murderer. They don't. They choose the murderer over the Messiah. Of course, they don't realize this is the time, right? And so catch what's going on emotionally. Uh, the guy just gets healed. Peter says, uh, Jesus did this. God's backing him. Oh, by the way, you killed Jesus. All right? So there's a problem. So he says, uh, you handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one, which was the name for the Messiah, and asked that a murderer be released to you. In fact, it gets worse. You know, it's like QVC. You get, you get more. Uh, you killed the author of life. Man, that's a bad day. You know, I don't care how you slice it. When you kill the author of life, not a good thing. Uh, but God raised him from the dead. So you killed him, God raised him, you're on the opposite side of God on this whole Jesus issue. And he says, we're witnesses of this, of the resurrection. And it says, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man you see, you know, he was, you know he's here every day, you saw him, was made strong. It's in Jesus' name, faith that comes through him that's completely healed him, we can see. He says, now, fellow Israelites, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. You didn't fully understand what's going on, but this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through the prophets in the Old Testament, saying that the Messiah would suffer. We'll talk more about that later. He says, so what you need to do is you need to repent. Now, today we hear the word repent. We think um, of a, like a religious word, a spiritual word. 
Um, just like when we hear the word church, we think of a religious word. Uh, in the Greek, the word for church is ekklesia. It just means assembly. Like when the Greeks would get together in a Greek city and they'd vote on an issue, that's the ekklesia. Uh, when the nation of Israel would travel through the wilderness, that was the ekklesia. Uh, it's not a religious word. Like it's become a religious word. In the same way, the word repent is not a religious word at the time of Jesus and the New Testament. And you read ancient documents of this time, people were repenting about, you know, kings would repent of this, uh, uh, people would repent of that. All it means is you made a mistake. You're sorry, you, you, you made the wrong decision. So to repent means to turn around. Think of it as like doing a U-turn, right? It's just not a religious word. You're like, hey, I repented of that. I changed my mind. I was wrong on that. And so in their case, to repent means to change their opinion about Jesus. Um, you, 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 you killed him. You need to repent. You need to change your opinion of that. You need to recognize he's your Messiah. Instead of killing him, you need to come under his leadership, ask the king of creation to forgive you, and then you, you serve that king as your Messiah. That's what it means to repent, right? So he says, um, you need to repent then, and you need to turn to God, catch us, so that your sins may be what? Let's say it again. Sins may be what? Now, this is powerful. We're going to come back to this later, but what Peter is saying, is one of the most amazing things in world history. He is saying it's possible for our sins not just to be overlooked, but to be wiped out. If I thought of this before, I would have done this. But I want you to picture a whiteboard up here. And I want you to picture your sins, their sins. You, you list them out. Peter says it's possible there is a way to have someone erase the board, wipe them out. Not, not, just, not just overlooked or not just move on, but wiped out. And their sin was killing the Messiah, which is pretty big. Like you may have adultery, affair, promiscuity, greed, betrayal, addiction, right? And bigger than all of them, is killing Messiah. <laughs> and he says, it's possible you screwed up royally. We've been waiting for this Messiah for hundreds of years, and you killed him. And it's possible to have that sin wiped out. Not just overlooked, wiped out as if it never happened. Amazing. Right, we'll come back to that. But I want to miss it. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, and he says, and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Not only would be wiped out, but that God would come to you, would refresh you, would restore your life. And that leads him to the next topic. And he would send the Messiah who's been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to, to what's the next thing? To restore everything. So from ancient times, the prophets have said over and over again, there will come a day when God will come and fix planet Earth. There will come a day when God comes, not to destroy it, we all go to heaven. There comes a day when God will come and restore all of creation. There will come a day when God will break into human time and space, and he will fix everything. There will come a day when the lion will lay down with the lamb. There will come a day when the trees of the field will clap their hands. There will come a day when the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. There will come a day when the blind will see and the lame will walk. There will come a day when God steps into human history, turns all wrongs to right, and the kingdoms of man are destroyed. All evil uh, and, and, and destructive things will be rooted out and the kingdom of God will come in power. And all the prophets said that. And the prophets refer to it as the day of restoration. And so what Peter is saying is that, hey, I know you've killed the Messiah, but the good news, your sins can be wiped out. You can be restored through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit here and now. And when that day of restoration comes and the Messiah comes to bring the kingdom of God in power, you can be a part. And so, that's the offer. And so, uh, verse 20, 22, he says, but you got to respond. You, this, this, this offer demands a response. And he's going to go back to the most important spiritual leader 
of their history, which is Moses. And they all love Moses. Moses is their guy. Moses gave them the law of God. These people would say, Moses is who we follow. And he says, okay, well, if you follow Moses, listen to what Moses said. And he says, Moses said, the Lord your God, this is from Deuteronomy 18, will raise up for you a prophet like me from amongst your people, and you must listen to everything he tells you. Now, we'll talk about this more later, uh, what, what he's referring to, but this is a prophecy about the Messiah. And he says, anyone who doesn't listen to him will be completely cut off. So he's like, this miracle shows that Jesus is the Messiah, you better listen. Right? So it's an amazing offer, but it demands a response. And then he says, indeed, uh, beginning with Samuel, who was kind of the first major prophet after, first significant prophet after Moses, all the prophets have spoken and foretold these days, you are their heirs. You are the heirs, the, the, kind of the sons and daughters of the prophets, and of the covenant, the relationship God uh, made with your fathers. And then he goes back to the start of the Jewish story, which is Abraham, and he says, he said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed, which was another reference to Messiah. We'll talk about that more when God raised up his servant, talking about Jesus, he sent him first to you. You get first shot at this, to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. All right, so that's the sermon, right? It's a synopsis. It's a summary, the most important points. But in this, in this message, uh, Luke is laying out for us as his readers uh, the core message. He's beginning to lay out. He already gave us one message in, in chapter 2 when Peter gave his sermon. Now he's building on that with the next sermon, helping us understand who Jesus is, what it means to follow him, uh, and what it means to live life on mission. And so what we're going to see is that there's a tremendous response to this sermon. That at the end of chapter 2, Luke said that uh, 3,000 men came to Christ. They, they said, Jesus is the Messiah. We're going to repent. We're going to be baptized. We're going to follow him as our king. Uh, at the end of this sermon, we were told 5,000 men have now converted. Uh, and so, of course, if 5,000 men, chances are he's not including women and children. And so th this movement of Jesus as Messiah in Jerusalem is now probably going at 10, 15,000 people. Very fast, rapid church growth. Fortunately, they don't have to build a building. They mean Solomon's colonnade. The temple is already there. Uh, and so this movement is ex a, uh, advancing rapidly as people who come to Jesus as their Messiah tell their family and friends, as the apostles are sharing the message of Jesus publicly, as God is performing signs and wonders to authenticate it, uh, rapid, rapid movement, right? So what I want to do today, this event that we've just seen happen is going to trigger a response from the religious authorities that will change the direction of the whole movement of Jesus, and next week we'll talk about that. But today I want to stop here. I want to talk about this message that we've looked at, uh, Peter's sermon, because uh, Luke is kind of helping us understand who Jesus is, what God is doing, what our story is, what God's story is, and what it means to be a follower of Jesus today and live life on mission. And so there in your note sheet, I want to take some time and unpack this and highlight just kind of three big picture principles. We've got to understand critical principles, what it means to be a follower of Jesus that flow out of this message. And so there's a section called Sent the Story. And uh, we're going to start with the first one. It's going to take much longer than the other two, so don't worry. I'll, he'll still get you out by noon. Uh, <laughs> so do number one, longer. Number two and three, go faster. All right, so here we go. Uh, first thing Peter wants us to understand, this crowd to understand, first thing Luke wants us to understand as his readers, is that the story of Jesus is the story of Israel. The story of Jesus is the story of Israel. Now, you say, what do you mean? Well, I want to use an analogy. You know that every week in this series, as we start off, I talk about, uh, just for those who are new, say that, hey, we're studying this book of Acts. There's a two-volume set, right? It's, uh, it's Luke and Acts, and it's like two seasons of a, of a movie that, or a, a TV drama that are designed to be read together. And so we, we've used that analogy. I want to expand that analogy, all right? I want to expand and say, hey, the story that God is telling in the Bible is like a long-running series. Uh, it's, like, uh, it's like 24. It's like Lost. Uh, for you sinners, it's like Breaking Bad. Uh, <laughs> and I won't even go into Game of Thrones. Anyway, uh, all right, so, uh, so when you watch a long-running series, like if you go on Netflix, you've never seen 24. You've never seen, you don't start at season six. You'll be lost. That's why it's called that, lost. You don't start, 
You don't start at season six, you start at season one. Why? Because there's a story being told. And when you get to season six, it's going to assume you've watched season one, and some of the things that are introduced there are going to be fulfilled in season six. You've got to understand the big picture story that's being told. Well, in the same way, God is telling a story in the Bible. And for us as modern-day Christians, we often jump in at season six, which is like Jesus, and we think we can just start at season six and understand the story. And we understand as Christians, there are a lot of seasons that have gone before. Ah, they're about Israel. And, you know, that didn't work out so well. Uh, That's kind of like God's plan A, Israel, the law. You know, it didn't really work. So God kind of scrapped that, started season, you know, started this whole new story, kind of a, a related series we call it the Jesus series. That's what, we're, that's what our story is about. It's like God's plan B, right? And the thing is, if we look at it that way, you and I will never understand the big picture story God's telling in the Bible, and we will never understand, catch us, our place in the story, and we will never understand what it means fully to live life on mission with Jesus. Like to understand the story that's being told in Jesus, we have to understand the story that's being told in Israel. Because here's what Peter is going to argue to this crowd. Everything that's happened in our history has been leading up to Jesus. Everything that's happened in the history of the Jewish race, all the key players, the key events, they were all leading up to season six. Right? And so what Peter's going to do in this message, in this sermon, he's basically going to tell them that. He's going to go back to their history, to key events, key episodes, and tie it all together to show them how everything was leading up to Jesus. The problem with us today is most of us don't know our Old Testaments very well. We've not been very schooled in this big picture story, and so we miss it. He's like a guy, like, let's say you're you're, uh, you're talking to your friend. You both are big fans of of Lost or one of the other series, And you can do a quick allusion back to season two or season one. Remember when that happened? You don't have to finish the sentence. Your friend knows exactly what you're talking about. You remember when that guy was underwater and he was looking out and he's ready to die? Oh, yeah, I remember. Okay, so you know the story, right? So just a quick allusion. You just mention it quickly. You know exactly what you're talking about. If you've never seen the previous five seasons, you don't. You're lost. So... Peter is going to throw out these allusions to, to kind of tie this thing together, how the story of Israel is all leading up to the story of Jesus, but the problem with us as modern-day Christ followers, we don't know the story of Israel. And so we miss it. It goes right over our heads, and we lose the depth. And so what I want to do today is just do a quick flyby of the story of Israel as Peter refers to it. And I want to highlight these allusions and show what he's showing. The story of Israel is the story of Jesus. It leads up to him so that we can understand the message that he's giving and how it applies to our life. And so what I've done there on your note sheet, I put five seasons, five illusions. Now, in Peter's telling, he doesn't tell them in chronological order. He jumps around. I put them in chronological order just to make it easier for us, right? So let's jump in. So season number one is the story, uh, I'm going to call it the story starts, and it's the key player in this story in, in season one is Abraham. Think of it like, an, you know, like key player in this season one. And so... He, so if you know this, the, the story of Israel starts with Abraham. He's the father of the race, right? And so God comes to him, and he says, Abraham, uh, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your home. I, I want you to travel to a land that I will show you. If you do this, I will bless you. I'll protect you. And then he says this mysterious thing at the end, in chapter 12, uh, verse 3. And, and then Peter referred to that today. Um, he says in chapter 12, and verse 3, he says, all peoples on earth will be what? Blessed, Blessed through you. And at the time, Abraham doesn't know what he's talking about, doesn't understand that. At the time, Israel doesn't understand. But what we're going to see is when the story comes to fulfillment in Jesus, it's through Jesus that all the world will be blessed. You see, he's the, it's through the Messiah. Okay, season, uh, season two. So we're jumping ahead here. We're moving fast. So we're going we're gonna to fast forward 700 years. The Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel. Israel has the 12 sons. We have the 12 sons, 12 tribes of Israel. And so they're going to go down to Egypt during time of famine. There are a series of events. They're going to become slaves. They're going to turn into a nation, two to three million people. They're going to be there for 430 years. 
After 430 years, God's going to raise up Moses to deliver them. Moses comes, leads them out to the Red Sea, delivers them. They come to Mount Sinai. God reveals himself, and he enters into, catch this word, very important word for you to understand. He enters into a covenant with them, which is like a, a relationship, kind of like marriage. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. And, uh, and so the spokesman for this covenant is Moses. God talks to Moses. Moses talks to the people. So the question is, when Moses dies at the end of his life, who's going to speak to the people? And so Moses, before he dies, in the book of Deuteronomy, he says, you know, don't worry about that. After I'm God, God will raise up another prophet to speak for him. And when he comes, you better listen. Now, in the short run, in the short term, he's referring to other prophets that God would come, a long line of prophets who would speak to the nation for, for, through God, like right in the short run. But as the rabbis studied this in the Old Testament, they became convinced that there was more to this than meets the eye. That Moses was speaking that one day there would be the ultimate prophet that would come. Kind of a second Moses, greater than Moses. And he would be like the Messiah who would be speaking for God. And so in Deuteronomy 18, and Peter quoted this today in our passage. And so in Deuteronomy 18, he says, the Lord, remember whenever you see Lord, all caps, the Old Testament means Yahweh. So Yahweh, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers from the nation. And you must listen to him. I'll put my words in his mouth. He will tell you everything I command him. And if anyone doesn't listen to my words that the prophet spoke in my name, I myself will call him into account. Okay, so, all right. So we move into season three. Season three, uh, I'm calling the prophets. Uh, key, key player is Samuel. Now, in Acts chapter 3, uh, Peter refers to him. He says, all the prophets from Samuel on. And so the first significant long-term prophet after Moses is Samuel. And the most important thing that Samuel ever does is he anoints David to be the great king of Israel. And from that point on, God spoke to David through Nathan the prophet, and many of the prophets would come after the next hundreds of years. God said that one day that he would raise up a great king who would be the greater son of David, who would be the king who would bring the kingdom of God, we talked about earlier, to planet Earth. He would be the Messiah. Right? And so the prophet, many of the prophets would prophesy about that, this greater king that would come. And then in season four, season four, I'm calling it the servant. Key player here is Isaiah. And so of all the prophets... The most important prophet in the Old Testament is probably Isaiah. And Isaiah has some of those specific prophecies about the coming of the son of David who would bring the kingdom of God. In fact, at Christmas time, we often see him on Christmas cards. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, you know, from the, shoot of, from the, from the root of uh, Jesse, a, a, a sprout will, will come, a shoot will come. Right, And so the lion will lay down with the lamb. And so some of the most important and powerful and predictive uh, prophecies of the coming of this Davidic king, the greater son, who would bring the kingdom of God, come through Isaiah. But catch this, and a lot of Christians don't know this. Isaiah also had four long prophecies about a mysterious character called the servant of Yahweh, or the servant of the Lord. All caps. And in these prophecies, the most famous of the prophecies is Isaiah 52 and 53. Many of you are familiar with this prophecy. And what Isaiah said is when the servant of Yahweh came, like God's going to send him, the nation of Israel, though he's the servant of Yahweh, will reject him. And that the people will execute him unjustly. And that when they execute him unjustly, they will think he's getting what he deserves. He's being executed for his own sin. Isaiah says the irony is he's actually being executed for the sins of the nation. By his transgressions, we will be healed. And by, by, by their, uh, he would, like he'd pay for their transgressions, by his wounds we'll be healed. And then Isaiah added this interesting thing at the end. He says, and yet this execution is not the end of the story because after he dies, that he will once again see the light of life. Now the reality was the rabbis would argue over this passage, who is the servant of Yahweh? It wasn't clear. 
It didn't become clear until after the resurrection of Jesus that the apostles began to realize that the son of David who would be king and the servant of Yahweh were the same person. That's chapter 4. And then season 5 is the restoration. Remember we talked about the restoration of all creation, the kingdom of God. So like I said, all the prophets would, almost all the prophets, would talk about this time when God would break into human history, turn all wrongs to right, and catch this, not destroy creation so we could all go to heaven. That was never the message. The message is that God would recreate the world. There'd be a new creation, there'd be a new heavens and a new earth in the sense it would be renewed. That this cosmos that had been destroyed and, and uh, ravaged by human sin and evil, that God would restore it to its created order. And that one and this would, and the kingdom of God would come uh, on earth. <laughs> okay, so that's the story. Now, here's what I want you to catch. If you are a Jew at the time of Peter, this is a story you've been raised on from the time you were a little kid. You know this story. You know every episode. You've, you have know every episode in Lost. You've watched it five times. You know every time an allusion is made to the story exactly what he's talking about. And so when Peter gives this quick overview flyby, they understand exactly what he's, he means, what he's saying. What he's saying is that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham that through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. What he's saying is that Jesus is the fulfillment of Moses' promise that God would send a greater prophet to speak for God. He, he was saying that Jesus is the son of David who would come to rule creation. He is saying that Jesus is the mysterious servant of Yahweh who would come to die for the sins of the nation. He's saying that Jesus is the one who's coming back to restore all of creation. That's the claim he's making. And so now that you understand the story a little bit, let's go back and read excerpts of that message, and you're going to pick it up. You're going to see it, like they, would, like they would have seen it. So there in your note sheet, I just put together some of the excerpts. So here's Peter's sermon that we just read earlier. <coughs> he says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, our God, this is our story, the God of our fathers, he's glorified his what? His servant, Jesus, the servant of the Lord, the servant of Yahweh. He's using servant language. This is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ, remember, Christ means Messiah, king that his king would suffer. That's season four. A servant of the Lord, suffering for the nation. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised through the holy prophets. That's season five, the restoration. For Moses said, this is Deuteronomy 18, this is season three, season two. Um, he said, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Everyone who doesn't listen to him will be completely cut off from the people. Indeed, from the prophets from Samuel on. Now we're now into season three. As many as have spoken have foretold these days. You know what's happening on Jesus. You are heirs of the prophets and of the what? The covenant. The special relationship with God. That God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham... Back to season one, he's going to quote Genesis 12. Through your offspring, all peoples on the earth will be blessed. So, do you understand this? If you're a Jew, you're listening with Jewish ears, what you're understanding what he's saying, he's saying our story as a nation is the story of Jesus. He is the hero. He is the protagonist. Everything in our past is leading up to this season and you missed it. You killed the protagonist. You killed the hero. Now, this is so important for us to understand as modern day followers of Jesus. 
Because what you need to understand is when you give your life to Jesus, or when you do give your life to Jesus, this is the story you become a part of. The story of Israel is your story. We're all sons and daughters of Abraham, as Paul will say in Galatians. The story of Israel becomes your story. You step into that story. You play a part in that story. And what is the story? When a person comes to Jesus, the story is not merely that you get saved so you can go to heaven. That's not the story. That's like a truncated character of a story. The story is that the God who created all things has made a promise from the very beginning that he would restore his whole creation. And that this God, when we rebelled against him, instead of destroying us as a race, he set into motion a powerful, amazing plan that he called one man Abraham and said, through Abraham, I'm going to bring the great king, the great prophet, the great priest, who is going to restore all of creation. And it's not just a blessing for Israel. That The whole point of Israel is to be the nation through whom the whole world will be blessed. And so when a man or woman comes to Jesus, you become part of this plan. Catch this. Destroyed creation is restored creation. Everything is healed. And this is why when the kingdom of God began to break in, Jesus around teaching healing, restoring, bringing people back into relationship. And this is why when you catch, when we become a follower of Jesus, this becomes our mission. Our mission is not just to be saved and forgiven so we can go to heaven when we die. That's temporary. When you die, you'll go to be with Jesus. Yes, that's temporary. What's going to be last is going to restore the new heavens and the new earth. It's going to restore all things, and we're going to be part of it. And we're going to rule with him. And we're going to be part of this new creation that's restored. And I'm going to know you. And you're going to know me. And we're going to have resurrected bodies. And they're physical. And they're real. And they're tangible. And the creation is going to be what it was supposed to be through the movement of King Jesus, who what this whole story is about. And so what it means to be the body of Christ today. What does it mean to be part of, the, of, of Jesus' movement today? It means not just that you're saved. It means we become part of the healing force that brings the kingdom of God wherever we go. When we go out and do things like all serve, the reason we do that is to give us just a foreshadowing of what it means to be the kingdom of God. That we go out to heal in Jesus' name. We go out to love in Jesus' name. We go out. It's a, it's a small thing that we do to help understand what we're called to do every day, that we heal our families We heal our marriages. We help heal our workplaces. We help heal the community. That the kingdom of God does not exist for us. We exist for the kingdom. The church of Jesus doesn't exist for ourselves. We exist for the world. That as the Father has, has sent Jesus, he says, so I send you. And wherever Jesus went, as Peter says, he went around sharing the news of the kingdom and doing good. And that's exactly what we're called to do. That we would let our light so shine before men that they would see our Father in heaven and glorify him. We go out to be a force for good wherever we go. And that is his calling on this church. And that's my prayer over this church, that we would understand we don't exist for ourselves, we exist for those out there, that we would be healed and restored, yes, our families would be restored, yes, our marriages would be restored, but we exist for a world out there that as the Father sent him, so he sends us. Amen? And this is what you need to come. When you, when you came to Jesus, you didn't come just to be saved and go to heaven. When you came to Jesus, he filled you with his spirit. He gave you gifts of his spirit so that you could go out, and as we learned earlier in the year in Epic, our series in Ephesians, it says that we were chosen, we were saved not by works, but we were saved to do good works that he planned in advance for us before the creation of time. There is a calling on your life. There's a calling on my life. There's a calling on our corporate life as a church. We don't exist for ourselves. We exist to advance the kingdom of God, to love people, to heal this race. And will we get all done? No, no. We won't. It's not going to get healed until Jesus comes back. But we are to be a sign and we're to be an example of what does it look like when the kingdom of God comes. It looks like that. You see, it looks like those people over there. All right, so that's number one. Now, number two. 
The second principle then is that this story, that God is telling, this story demands a response. And this is what Peter does. He tells a story, how the story of Israel is the story of Jesus, and, and so it's all leading up to Jesus. And he says, now, hey, if that's true, then that demands a response because, hey, listen, let's be honest, you just killed the, the wrong guy. You killed the Messiah. So uh, here's the thing. You, he says, I understand you acted in ignorance. You didn't understand what you were doing. But it doesn't change the fact that you killed the Messiah. And so you thought that Jesus wasn't part of the story. You thought that Jesus was a threat to the story. You thought that God was writing a story over here and that Jesus was pretending to be part of the story as Messiah. He really wasn't. And that he was a threat to the true story of God. And so you killed him. You, you wrote that character out of the story. The only thing is, God put him back in the story. And the reality is, is that he is the story. That he is, everything's leading up to him. And so if that's true, then it demands a response. And he says, it demands a radical response. Because he killed the Messiah. And he uses this little word, repent. He says, you need to repent. You need to change the way you look at Jesus and you need to come back and you need to ask Jesus to forgive you and to wipe away your sins. So times of refreshing can come, the Holy Spirit, and so that when the Messiah comes back to restore all things, that final chapter of the story, that you're a part of that story. It demands response. If the story is true, it demands response. Now, that is true of every one of us in this room. For every one of us in this room, unless you came to Jesus like when you were four years old, so you didn't have much of a past. <laughs> and at four years old, you probably didn't have any other story than the one your, your parents told you. That there's a God and he created, but you, know, you can accept Jesus in your heart and that's your story and that's the only story you've known. But if that's not true, if you came to Jesus later in life, then here's the reality. Each of us, has bought in to the wrong story. Every one of us has a story of how the world works, of what life's about. They, they were in the story, the story of Israel. And they thought Jesus wasn't a part of the story. They were in the wrong story. Every one of us has a, was telling ourselves a wrong story. Some of you kind of grew up or your story that you bought into was it? this is a random universe in spite of the order, in spite of the beauty, in spite of the relationship, that you know, this whole thing is just a big accident. And therefore, there's no creator, there's no one to report to, you can do what you want, you can make up your own rules. And that was a story you bought into. Maybe some of you still bought into that story today. Uh, others of us here, we, we bought into a story, a different story. Maybe it was a story of Buddhism. Maybe it was a story of Islam. Maybe it's a story of Jehovah's Witness. Maybe it's a story of Oprah, right? <laughs> uh, but we all bought into a story. We all, this is how life works. This is what the story of life works. This is who God is, or there is no God, but this is, a, you know, this is who God is, and this is how life works, and this is the story. And then there comes a day when God in his mercy and grace opens our eyes to see that we are completely wrong about the story. And we have completely underestimated what the story is about and who the leading character is. There comes a day when God opens our eyes to see that, no, everything in this story is about a God who's amazing and brilliant and personal and profound and creative and loving, who creates a world and he creates us that we bear his image and manage this world for him as the first king and first queen. And we rebelled against him as a race. And we've each participated in that rebellion. And that he has sent his son to be the end of the story, the key player in the story. And there comes a day we realize who Jesus is like they were realizing on this day. And the moment you realize that God opens your eyes to who Jesus is, you may have been ignorant before like them, so I know you were ignorant. You may have been ignorant before, but the day he opens your eyes, you're no longer ignorant. Amen. And on that day, it demands a response. And it demands a radical response. 
that the Bible calls repentance. Hey, before I understood I live for myself, I, 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 I live life by my own rules, I was my own God, or I follow these other gods, and, and I did my own thing, and I, I rebelled, whatever, but, but now I realize that I'm part of that race that put Jesus on the cross. And, and so I'm on the wrong side of God on this whole Jesus issue. And I am the one who's rejected the ultimate prophet. And I am the one who helped kill the Messiah. That's, I'm the reason why he had to come. And, and so once we realize it requires a radical realignment of our life, that we come under the leadership of King Jesus, we come to him and we ask him to wipe away our sins and to restore, to refresh us with his spirit. We come under his leadership, part of his mission, that he becomes our king. And catch this, what Peter says is our eternal destiny hangs in the balance of how we respond to the story God's telling. Now, number three. The third principle is that it's not too late to join God's story. Now, this is amazing. Um, because the story, what Peter is saying, is big and unbelievable as it is, is that you people killed the Messiah. You killed the author of life. And so you'd expect him to say, so you're done, you're toast. But he doesn't say, but the king that you killed, he's offering amnesty. He's offering a second chance. He's offering you a new life. That, that it's possible to have your sin of murdering the Messiah wiped out. And it's possible for you to restore your relationship with the Messiah that you killed and with the God who sent him. And it's possible to have times of refreshing. And it's possible to be rewritten back into the story so when that Messiah comes, you'll be part of the future, this amazing future that's coming. It's an amazing offer. Amazing offer. If we saw it for the first time, you'd say, no way. If we're not blown away, it's only because we're too familiar. It's uh, amazing. But of course, this is the offer that Jesus makes to all of us. Right? Now, I want to talk to both the, those of you who've given your life to Jesus and those who haven't yet. Right? So let me talk to those who have. Here's what I want to say. This is such an amazing offer that even for those who are followers of Jesus, we struggle with this. We come to Jesus and we know he promises to forgive us. But the reality is there's many of us in this room that struggle with believing that he's truly wiped away our sins. There's some of you here that you still struggle with. You feel like you were so promiscuous before you came to Jesus or after you came to Jesus. You're so promiscuous that, that he could never really use you. Hey, you understand he forgave you, but you had three abortions. No one can take that away, and so that's always going to be on your record. That you had that affair that broke up your marriage. That you betrayed your business partner. No one can take that away. Um, that the addictions that you had and what it drove you to do can never take that away. Uh, the lies that you told that hurt people, the way you've hurt people. Maybe it's things that have been done to you. You were sexually molested for years. And as a result, you came to believe that you, your value must be nothing because you were treated as nothing. And, and maybe this is true for other people, but it's not true for you. And what Peter is saying, what Luke is saying, what Jesus is saying is, no, no, no. This offer is not for other people. <laughs> this offer is for you. Amen. You take that whiteboard, you put whatever your past is on there, and catch this. What it's saying is that Jesus is bigger than whatever your past is about. Amen. That song we sang about he's bigger? Jesus is bigger. Hey, what is your sin? What is it you have done against God? The message of Jesus is that whatever you have done against God is not bigger than what Jesus has done for you. Amen. The cross is bigger. It's possible you wiped out. And so if you're here, you're a follower of Jesus, I just need to speak into your hearts for me and say, hey, do not 
let your past, regardless of what your past is, how distant it is or how recent, do not let your past define you. Amen. The message of the gospel is that Jesus has come to redefine you. That he has come to do a new thing in your life. He has come to do a new creation. He has come to do a resurrection. That when Jesus walks into a life, all things are made new. If any person is in Christ, he is a new creation. That when you came to Jesus, the work of the new creation that's coming started in you. You are already part of the resurrection life that's coming. And one day you will see that new body, but you're already there. You have one foot in eternity now. That you are there, that he loves you, he is passionate, and nothing that you have done or has been done to you can keep you from fulfilling the mission of God in your life. Amen. That he has called you. And so as believers, we need to understand it's not too late to be part of the story. And we need that constantly affirmed. And then for those of you who are not yet followers of Jesus... You may say, but you don't understand. That may be true for others, but it's not true for me because here is my story, and it's too big to be a part of God's story. My story is too big, it's too evil to be written into God's story. No, no. Here's what God does when we come to Jesus He takes our story of evil and He writes it into His story, and He takes what we have done or what was done to us for evil, and he turns it to good. He will transform your story. He will take your life and your story, however evil it was, what you've done with, and he will transform it and make it part of God's story of amazing redemption. And you say, no, they may be true for others, Mike. It's not true for me. Let me tell you, unless your sin is bigger than murdering the Messiah, Amen. you are are in. But it requires radical repentance. And to not choose to respond to the story is to remain on the wrong side of the story and the wrong side of not just now, but for eternity. Let's pray. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, uh, let me, let me talk first to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and just say, is there any area of your life that you've felt you've held on to, something you've done or has been done to you that has felt like you're disqualified, you're second class, you can never be. You might be in the kingdom, but you can't be used in the kingdom, or it undercuts your confidence. I just want to speak to you in the name of Jesus and say there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that his word over you is love and grace and a new life. And so, is there something you need to embrace today to trust him for, to let go of the past? And then for those of you here, here you're not yet given your life to Christ, I want to give you a chance. We said that this story demands a response, so I want to give you a chance to respond. If you're here today and you say, I want in, I want to leave my past, I want to leave my past to rebellion. I haven't recognized who Jesus is, but today I do, and I want to become part of God's story. I want to repent. I want my past wiped away. I want to experience times of refreshing. I want to be part of that future that's coming. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to pray with me a very simple prayer. We're going to ask Jesus to become king of your life and to forgive you. And you can just pray along with me in your mind, in your heart, and God will hear you as you pray. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I apologize for a living life on my own and not living as if you're the king. And I ask you to forgive all my sin, my rebellion, come into my life, restore me, teach me how to follow you, and prepare me for that new world that's coming. Use me for your mission. Well, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you just pray that, first of all, I want to welcome you to the kingdom. And secondly, um, I'd love to send you a letter this week. Let's just, here's some next steps in your relationship with Jesus as you start this journey. that will be helpful to you. And so if you do me a favor, on the back of, uh, inside your program is a little card called the Connect Card. You can fill out the front and on the back just say, ask Jesus into my life or something like that. And we will, we will write to you this week. And so God, we come now and we thank you. God, as we come to worship you now, as we bring your offerings, 
We thank you that when you walk into the room, everything changes. And that we become part of the new creation that's coming. Resurrection has happened. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.